Shalom, blessings, welcome. I always forget to remove that. I am James with Fiery Faith Ministries, and I'm so blessed that you are here joining us for today's message. It's another wonderful reading portion as we have embarked into Exodus, the book of Shemot, meaning names. And we know the importance of names, and we're just so blessed that we can call upon our Father in heaven, His Son, our Messiah, that we can call upon Him for our needs, our desires, those things that are upon our heart. He is listening and He is waiting for us to call out to Him. And it is just a blessing to read the Scriptures each and every day. We are so blessed to be able to do this online, fellowshipping with those far and wide. Uh, it's a wonderful gathering. Each time is different, and it is a blessing because we know that the Father is leading this, and we just pray and believe that His words will be spoken and that the message will be received for all those listening, whether this be live now or if for in years to come, if someone stumbles across these messages our, our prayer is that eyes and ears can be opened for the first time because we all have been there. We all were blind, just like Paul on the road to Damascus. And those scales were shattered away by the light that is the Messiah, revealing new truths and understanding and wisdom. And we can find that continuing in the word, line by line, precept upon precept. I love that verse, and we're actually going to read that today in our half Torah. So welcome, everybody. Glad that you are here. Let's say hello to a few folks in the chat. Start with Narrow Way. We are truly what we eat. So pull up a chair to the table and enjoy this delicious manna prepared by the Most High. I believe our server today is Brother James. Amen. Thank you for being here. Blessings to you. And Andrea is here. She's hungry for the word. We all are. And that is the wonderful thing about it. The word is so fulfilling. We won't go hungry. We won't ever thirst again when we choose the bread of life, everlasting water. But we still seek it out. We still desire it. It is so fulfilling. But we continue to want more and more. And it is provided each and every time we dig in, whether we've read it a hundred times, a thousand times, there's something always new to glean. And that's the beautiful thing about it. This is a great comment from Narrow Way. They're like a tag team ministry. Amen, brother. It is a blessing that we can do this basically six days a week. Uh, we do take the Sabbath off, but then again, we're in other fellowships uh, as well that day. So it is a a seven-day week study for us, whether we're just reading the scripture, whether we're studying it for ourselves, whether we're sharing a message. I know I was not the greatest studier in school, but the Father is making up for it here, and I'm constantly learning, constantly in the Word, and no better way than that to learn. You know, we don't choose just one day of fellowship. We choose every day to fellowship to seek after the kingdom, to be in the word. And it is such a blessing to have this opportunity. And you are all such a blessing to us as we grow together. So hallelujah for that. Welcome, Wire Wool. So thankful to partake of this blessing today. Amen. Glad you are here. And Sue, blessings to you in Wales. Great to have you here. Hope your afternoon is going wonderful. Judy, welcome. Good morning to you as well. Great to have you here as always. Anyone else out there? I'm just scrolling through the comments. Thank you for joining today. Lee says, rejoice for this day Yahuwah has made. I'm praising him for each of you. I am praising his protection and guidance. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. Amen. And welcome, Pat. Shalom to you. Blessings and glad you are here. Jamie, good morning to this beautiful day, the beautiful family y'all has given us. We are so blessed, and we know new are coming, 
And it's just so exciting to know that Yahweh is continuing to reveal his truth. And whether it be this ministry or another, we are all on the same team. This is Team Yahweh. yod heh vav -Heh is his name. And we are marching for him. We are listening for his orders. We are fighting the good fight against the evil, against the darkness, the principalities. We have to keep our armor tight. Keep it on each and every day because each day is a new battle, is a new trial that comes our way. With the word, we can use it for offense or defense. It is the sword, and we are so blessed to have that, the instructions that guide us on our path, on this journey, as we seek the promised land. Welcome, Sherry. Glad to have you here as well. Blessings to you. And Monique, welcome, all those seeking Yahuwah in the mighty name of Yahusha. Amen. And welcome, The Rock. Great to have you here. Hey, you guys. All right. Great quote as well. Thank you for joining. Blessings to you and everyone else. We're just so blessed that you are here. George, Brother George, good to have you here. We're always thankful for those that are able to join live, but if you're able to watch at any time, may it be blessing to you. And B.W. Bailey, welcome and shalom. And Angie, welcome. Blessings to you this morning, along with Sonia. Great to have both of you here. All right. I did want to share our prayer. Lee always posts such a beautiful prayer to start our day off, to introduce the shows on our Telegram. So if you're not on Telegram, please join us. Otherwise, you're not going to sometimes get to read these. Of course, I do try to always include them in our description for the video. So check that out as well, and you can find those here. She says, Yahweh, we bless you, Father, Kodesh above all. We call on your name, Yahweh, yod heh vav -Heh, our creator, protector, provider, healer, father, and friend, and our everything. You hold the sun, moon, and stars. Hold on, I want to make sure this is the right one here. Yes, it is. Sorry. You hold the sun, moon, and stars in your hands. You knew us before our form took shape, and you placed us in the light. You set us apart and called us your daughter and son. You sent your Yahid, Yahusha Hamashiach, because you could not bear losing one of us. Yahweh, give us your wisdom and understanding. Fill us to the top with your living water. Sweeten what was made bitter with your instructions. We thank you for your perfect timing. And we willingly give our lives in obedience to you. Father, we pray we never forget the reason behind your Sabbaths, your feasts, your set-apart days, your Moedim. I pray we focus on the meaning of these days. What is to be remembered? what you say to remember about them forever, what price has been paid so that we have the bread, the wine, and living waters. Give us new wine skins and create in us a clean heart with feet that only run to you. Blessed be your name, Yahweh and Yahusha. Blessed be the Ruach HaKodesh, our advocate and comforter. In Yahusha HaMashiach's name we pray, let it be so and let your kingdom come. Amen. And Maranatha. Hallelujah. Thank you for that prayer. So wonderful. Now, I know we mentioned it on our fiery fellowship the other day. If you were able to watch that, if you weren't able to stick with us to the end, we did have an announcement. So I'm just going to go ahead and share it while we're starting, while it's on my mind. We are having our first fiery faith ministries gathering. This is going to be our Pesach Passover gathering. It's going to be at Edgar Evans, Tennessee State Park, a beautiful location. We've had Passover there in the past, and it was a wonderful time, a very beautiful location that we want to be able to gather together once again, meet our family here in person, fellowship with one another. We are doing a three-night event. It's going to be March 23rd 
through the 25th. Now you're welcome to come early. You're welcome to stay late. Um, we are going to be there the three nights. And so we're so looking forward to it. They have campsites for tent camping for RV. They also have cabins that can be rented. So you can pick your preference. I've listed the links below in our description. If you are interested in joining us, please do check those out. You can reserve those. Um, there are quite a few options still available, but you know those will be booking up in the coming weeks. So definitely check that out if you would like to join us. We would love to have you. You're welcome to join. If you have any questions, please reach out to us. We'll be glad to help you out. It's about 30 minutes from Nashville maybe east of Nashville on a beautiful lake where Lee and I were rebaptized two years ago. And it was a wonderful event. We're looking forward to making new memories with our family here. So we would love to have you. Just wanted to share that out there. Please join us if you can. All right. So let's go ahead and get started with this week's portion. It was a blessed portion. And <laughs> I say that each time. You know, I'm always just looking back on past readings and trying to see if there's even a favorite that I can pick. And there's not because they all are so wonderful and so special. They hold the same importance. They hold the same deep meaning, even though they are all unique. This week, though, is very special because not only are we seeing the birth of Moshe, the greatest prophet to live in the Old Testament, but we're also seeing the greatest prophet to live in the New Testament, our Messiah, Yahushua HaMashiach. Both are being birthed, coming to life. And we see a lot of similarities actually within their story from the birth to the end. It is so beautiful. And so I'm looking forward to sharing what we've come across here in this reading today. Please share your insights. This is a very important passage and scripture that we'll be reading. So I'd love to hear your comments on it as well. Now the half Torah, it's kind of a two part. It's coming out of Isaiah 27 verses six, all the way through chapter 28, 13, and then two verses out of chapter 29 verses 22 and 23. And the Basora reading is out of Matthew chapter 2, 1 through 12. So with this week's half Torah, we see parallels of our Torah reading on many levels, even within the Basora. One of the parallels here in the half Torah is the message of redemption conveyed by Isaiah, Yeshiyahu. And you shall be gathered one by one, O children of Yasharel. That is reminiscent of the message of redemption that Yahweh spoke to Moshe at the burning bush, a message that Moshe then communicates to Pharaoh. Later on then in the passage, we see the prophet proceeds to berate the drunkenness of the ten tribes, warning them of the punishment that awaits them, those that have gone after their own lust and fleshly desires those that have forsaken the word, forsaken the father, there is going to be consequence. And throughout scripture, there have been prophets to warn <clears throat> and rebuke that because there is going to be judgment coming on the earth. It already has, but it's going to come again. We want to make sure that we are walking in his ways, guarding his commandments, the commandments that Messiah came to teach and preach on. They are the commandments of the Father. If you love him, do his commandments, he says. If you love me, do his commandments is really what he spoke of. They were the commandments of the Father, not of his own. But he was there to continue teaching the commandments that were written in stone by Yahweh's finger into the tablets, the most important ten words, the Devarim that we have ever received that we are still trying our best to honor, to guard, and to teach. And we're so blessed that we have those, that we have seen the light. The Word made flesh came as the light from the very beginning in Genesis. Let there be light was spoken. 
And the word was with Elohim and still is. Hallelujah. All right, so let's get going here. All right, I see a few comments here. And welcome, Samuel. We are still continuing to pray for you. We will put that request in our prayer group as well so that we can lift up your ministry and the needs that you have, brother. Yahuwah will provide. Let's have faith in him, knowing that he will provide when we ask. And let's see, I see this comment here from Narrow Way Path. Do you think you can do any live streams from the Passover? We will definitely try. I know that internet is a little spotty there, uh, but we will definitely make sure that we can do our best to do so. If not, at least record some and we'll be able to post them uh, maybe later that week. But we will look into that and definitely try to make that happen. Thank you for asking. I hadn't even thought about it, but that would be very special to be able to have a live gathering fellowship with everyone that's able to make it. So hallelujah. All right, Isaiah 27. Let me get a drink first here. I've already been talking a lot. Now it's the important words, the words from one of my favorite prophets, Yeshiyahu. He shall cause them that come of Yaakov to take root. Yasharel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. Hallelujah. We are to bear fruit from our own deeds, from the works that we perform. That is how our fruit can be given and can be seen and can be received by others. They can benefit from that fruit. It's not necessarily for us to benefit from. It's for others to benefit from. We can bear that by giving examples, by walking in the footsteps of Messiah. Just think of how many have benefited from the fruit that he was able to bear by his actions, his example. Hallelujah. Has he smitten him as he smote those that smote him? Or is he slain according to the slaughter of them that are slain by him? In measure, when it shoots forth, you will debate with it. He strays his rough wind in the day of the east wind. By this, therefore, shall the iniquity of Yaakov be purged. And this is all the fruit to take away his sin. When he makes all the stones of the altar as chalk stones that are beaten in sunder, the Asherah poles and images shall not stand up. Hallelujah. The world is continuing to lift up their idols their Asherah poles, whether it be the Christmas tree or the obelisk that we see originating from Mitzrayim that's now the very one sitting at the Vatican or on top of each church steeple. Those are Asherah poles of idols. They are not meant to worship Yahuwah. It's unfortunate that they are still being lifted up all around, but they will crumble. They will not stand. That's a warning for us today, as it was for them. Yet they defensed, yet the defense city shall be desolate, and the habitation forsaken and left like a wilderness. There shall the calf feed, and there shall he lie down and consume the branches thereof. When the boughs thereof are withered, they shall be broken off. The woman Come and set them on fire, for it is a people of no understanding. Therefore, he that made them will not have mercy on them, and he that formed them will show them no favor. These idols can come in many forms, whether it be clay, iron, silver, gold. There's so many different forms. We see idol worship. All around, we are lifting man up on a pedestal. We are making men gods. And there is only one true Elohim. Yes, there are many lowercase gods out there, but they will be destroyed. They will crumble. They will ultimately burn along with those that are following them and worshiping them, giving them their praise. 
Forgive them, for they know not what they do. They lack the knowledge, the understanding. They are being led astray by false doctrine, by words of man, traditions of man, holidays. There's so many ways. Even the music and the media is brainwashing and deceiving those that are willing to listen. We have to guard our hearts. More importantly, our ears and our eyes, what allows it to enter into our heart, enter into our mind. They are doorways into our soul, and we must make sure that we are guarding them, that we not let that filth and wickedness in, but leave it for only pure and holy things. Because we want to be a clean vessel. If we're allowing just a drop of poison in, it's going to taint the whole batch. And it shall come to pass in that day that Yahweh shall beat off from the channel of the river unto the stream of Mitzrayim, and ye shall be gathered one by one, O ye children of Yasharel. And it shall come to pass in that day that the great shofar shall be blown, and they shall come with were ready to perish in the land of Asher and the outcasts in the land of Mitzrayim and shall worship Yahweh in the holy mount at Yerushalayim. He will gather us again. He's going to gather his remnant for that great day of worship. We look forward to that. We want to be worthy that we are included into that group. We are walking out the ancient ways his ways, the narrow path, in prayer and supplication, wanting to be included, wanting to be a part of that remnant. Chapter 28. Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. What a statement that is. You know, I just see the vanity that our world is consumed with. Their glory and their beauty is going to fade. Now they are constantly trying to find a way to stay ageless, to reverse aging, which seems like they kind of have, but at what cost? Selling your soul, consuming blood, sacrificing the youth. Is it worth it? Is it worth eternal damnation to stay young, to keep your wrinkles from coming in? It's not. But man has been blinded, deceived by the drunkenness of their sin, of their vanity. We are not in control when we have had too much to drink. Now this can be metaphorically or physically. We lose control and discernment when we let the spirits that we know as alcohol enter in and take over. We don't make wise decisions. Behold, Master has a mighty and strong one, which as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. The crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, shall be trodden under feet. And the glorious beauty, which is on the head of the fat valley, shall be a fading flower. And as the hasty fruit before the summer, which when he that looks upon it sees, while it is yet in his hand, he eats it up. In that day shall Yahweh Sevaoth be for a crown of glory, for a diadem of beauty unto the remnant of his people, and for a ruach of judgment to him sits in judgment, and for strength to them that turn the battle to the gate. You know, life here is fading, but Yah never fades. He never changes. His words stand forever. Let's make sure that we are putting all of our chips, all of our marbles, whatever the expression you want to use is, let's put all of our efforts and our desires and our wants 
on him, not of our flesh, not of what the world makes important. It's a lie and a deception. It's only going to fade away, wither back to dust as where it came. But they also have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet had erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no clean place. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with foreign lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. But the word of Yahuwah was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. I love that expression, and it is so true, so important on our walk that we aren't cherry-picking our scripture, that we aren't combining this and that and making up our own concoction. Many times that's what religion has done. If you're just relying on three to five verses a week, one day a week in your church, you're not being fed. You're on the milk. You're not willing and wanting more. We want the meat. We have to be weaned off of that. And how do we do so? It's precept upon precept, line by line. Start at the very beginning. If you've never read your Bible from front to back, do it now. Make that your resolution of the year, if you want to call it that. Start now. There's no better time. The Father will reveal things like you've never seen before if you're willing to read line by line. That is where the fruit of the word comes from. That is where the wisdom and understanding comes from. And we're still learning. Even if we've read it before, line by line, there's still so much hidden in between those lines. And it is so wonderful that it changes for us personally. Not that the word changes, but depending on the season and the trials and the understanding that we are in year after year, it takes on new meaning and understanding. And that is why it is so important. It may seem simple. It may seem like a small task. Maybe some people are too prideful and realize, I don't need to do that. I already understand. If you have that kind of attitude, you're completely wrong. And woe to you. You need to be in your scriptures each and every day. There are so many different Bible reading plans, it doesn't matter where you start, but just read your scripture. That is the most important thing. And the Father will speak to you personally in your timing, in your understanding. We all have to start somewhere. And now is the best time if you haven't started yet. Let's finish up with the last two scriptures out of Isaiah 29. Therefore, thus says Yahuwah, who redeemed Avraham concerning the house of Yaakov. Yaakov shall not now be ashamed, neither shall his face now wax pale. But when he sees his children, the works of my hands, in the midst of him, they shall sanctify my name and sanctify the Holy One of Yaakov and fear the Elahai of Yasharel. We are to have a fear of our Creator. If you don't fear Him, you're not reading your scriptures enough. You're cherry-picking and only tickling your ears. 
the words in the scripture are for our benefit. It may hurt. It may offend us. It may be hard to see it that way, but the word stands forever. They are the words for our benefit, for our instructions, for our chastisement. Just as a parent chastise his child that loves him, not to hurt him, not to, you know, anything, but to only help him learn and grow for his betterment. That is what the father does many times through the trials that he sends our way. It may seem like a burden. It may seem difficult. Why are you doing this? I don't deserve this. Whatever your question may be, but we have to look further. We have to realize that the father knows the beginning and the end. He knows our plan. He knows what we need. So he's allowing that to happen just like he allowed it to happen to Job. He needed to test him. Many things in life are a test. And how are we going to overcome that? How are we going to handle it? Are we going to look for him for guidance and help? Or are we going to try to solve the own issues with our, our flesh and our decisions? If you've done that in the past, I guarantee you, you realize it didn't probably work very well because you didn't allow Yahuwah to intervene to provide the solution that you need. We must always look to him. And that's right, Andrea. So much to learn, unlearn, and relearn as we read with Yah's help and understanding Yada. Hallelujah. So very true. The fear of Yahweh is honor and glory and gladness and a crown of rejoicing. Amen. We want to receive that crown one day that the Messiah will place upon each of his Kodeshim. The chosen remnant will receive a crown of glory. Are we going to receive one because we have been faithful and true to his ways, shining the light that he put within us, bringing new believers, those that have been lost, those that are feel hopeless in life. There is always hope and redemption through our Messiah, through the blood that he sacrificed for us. He gave of his life for us. All right, let's get in into the Basora. Another profound reading, like as I mentioned at the beginning. What a connection here. We have the birth of Moshe in the Torah reading. And now we have the birth of our King, the Messiah, the Mashiach in our Basura reading. Really wonderful. So in Matthew chapter 2, we're starting at verse 1. Now when Yahushua was born in Bethlehem, Bethlehem of Yahud, in the days of Herod the king, Behold, there came Magi from the east to Jerusalem. So we see Matthew actually tells us little about the birth of Yahushua. We see more of that in Luke, where he records these familiar details. But what happens in Matthew, he tells us something about after the birth, the birth when he was born in Bethlehem. Looking into Bethlehem, it was the ancestral home of King David, the great king of Israel and founder of the royal dynasty. However, it was not a large or significant town. Bethlehem was quite a little town, roughly six miles to the south of Jerusalem. It is called Beit Lechem of Yahud to distinguish it from another town in Galilee the tribe of Zebulun, of the same name. Also, in the olden days, it had been called Ephrathah. That name might be familiar to you if you've been reading along with us on our weekly Torah reading in Genesis 35, and also, I believe, in our last portion, at the end of Genesis, it was referenced. But in Genesis 35, 19, it says, And Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrathah, which is Bethlehem, Bethlehem. So King Herod is in power at this time, and this is a symbol 
of the human being who only seeks his own honor, a picture of the anti-Mashiach who assumes power. At the second coming of Messiah, his return in power and majesty, this false king, the anti-Mashiach or the antichrist, will sit on the throne and will be judged by him. We know Herod was indeed great in many ways, in some ways great as a ruler, builder, and administrator, but in other ways he was great in politics and cruelty, cruelty in murder. He loved power. He inflicted incredibly heavy taxes on the people and resented the fact that many considered him a usurper. In his last years, suffering an illness that compounded his paranoia, he turned to cruelty and in fits of rage and jealousy, killed close associates, even his own family, I believe his wife and three sons. Thank you, Sherry. I did not know that. Bet, bet. Well, of course I did, looking into the Hebrew name. Bet means house, so that's perfect. We have Bet Lecham. Amen. The house of the Messiah. I love that. The, the origini, originate, originating place of our king. Thank you. So these travelers called wise men, the Magi, which in ancient Greek is Magi. Misconceptions and legends abound about these wise men. They were not kings, but wise men, which means they were studied in astrology, medicine, and even occult natural science. It probably developed under the influence of Old Testament passages that would say, kings will come and worship the Messiah. Traditions even tell us their names, supposedly known as Melachor, Kaspar, and Balathzar, who were more likely from maybe Persia or even Mesopotamia. It is said that you can actually see their supposed skulls in the great cathedral at Cologne, Germany. Interesting and kind of creepy. They seem to have come not on the birth night, but probably several months later, maybe even a few years later, and we'll get into that here in a moment. But there's a wonderful passage out of Isaiah 60 that foreshadows this very event to come. 60 verses 1 through 6. Arise, shine, for your light is come, and the glory of Yahweh is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But Yahweh shall arise upon you, and his glory shall be seen upon you. And the other nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes round about and see. All they gather themselves together. They gather to you. Your sons shall come from afar and your daughters shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and flow together, and your heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be turned back unto you. The forces of the other nations shall come unto you. The multitude of camels shall cover you. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephra, all they from Shiva shall come. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall show forth the praises of Yahuwah. Hallelujah. How wonderful is that? Many wonderful foreshadowings we see in Isaiah of our coming king. Verse 2, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Yahudim? For we have seen his star rising in the east and are come to worship him. It is a strange thing for a baby to be born a king. Usually they are princes for a long time before they become king. His kingly status was not conferred on him later on. It was from birth. In Numbers 24, 17, 
It says, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Yaakov, and a scepter shall rise out of Yasharel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Seth. Wow. Powerful. A born king of the Jews is the hope of the Gentiles, also according to the promise that was given. There are many different suggestions for the natural origin of this remarkable star. Some say it was a remarkable conjunction of the heavenly bodies seen above. The planet Jupiter, Saturn, and even Mars, maybe even including an additional star. Some believe this same conjunction occurred before the birth of Moses. Now that's incredible. And I have heard that before. I wanted to share it because this was a sign in the heavens. We know there are many signs within the heaven. The two greatest prophets, there was a sign given that they were coming. Others suggest maybe even a supernova. And some think of a comet a specially created unique star or sign. But I love here, notice how it says it was his star. That's wonderful. The wise men came first to Jerusalem, assuming that the leaders of the Jews would be aware and excited about the birth of their Messiah. The wise men were about to find that they, that this was not the case at all. They were not excited. They did not want to even go see what this was about. Verse 3, when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Herod was constantly on guard against threats to his rule and his throne, especially from his own family. He assassinated many family members who he suspected of disloyalty. His being troubled is completely in character. Herod was a bloody and violent ruler. He had no sooner come to the throne than he began to, uh, the annihilating of the Sanhedrin. He slaughtered 300 court officers. He even murdered his wife and her mother, Alexandra, his eldest son, Antipater, and his two other sons, Alexander and Aristobulus. Famous names that we've heard before, murdered by King Herod. Verse 4, And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Mashiach should be born. So when we see the name chief priest, this would ex include those who once held the office of high priest. Herod changed the high priest often because it was largely a political appointment to him. And then when we see the name scribes, these were known as teachers of the law. Other English versions call them scribes, but they were experts in the Old Testament and in its oral tradition. Their work was not so much copying the Old Testament manuscripts as what we might think of as a scribe but teaching the Old Testament. They kept records of the courts of justice, the registers of the synagogues. They wrote articles of contracts and sale, bills of divorce, and etc. They were even called lawyers. Interesting. Verse 5, And they said unto him, In Bet Lechem of Yahud, for thus it is written by the prophet, the Sanhedrin answered without hesitation. The question where he would be born had been settled already by prophecy, which we can find in Micah chapter 5 2. It says, But you, Biet Lacham, Ephratha, though you be little among the thousands of Yahudim, I'm sorry, out of the thousands of Yahuda, yet out of you shall he come forth unto me. That is, to be the ruler in Jerusalem. Those going forth have been from the old, from everlasting. 
the chief priests and scribes understood that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem of Judea, distinguishing it from another town of the same name further north, as we spoke about earlier. Sadly, these experts had the right information, but seem personally uninterested in meeting the Messiah for themselves. Had they met with the shepherds of Bethlehem, they had received, they would have received better intelligence than they could from the learned scribes of Jerusalem. Verse 6, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Yehuda, are not the least among the princes of Yehuda, for out of you shall come a governor that shall rule my people, Yasharel. Looking at this word, governor, meaning a ruler, this is one of the characters of the Messiah who is the king of his people. The word rule here means to rule as a shepherd does his flock in faithfulness and tenderness. Isaiah 40, verses 10 and 11. Behold, Master Yahweh will come with strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. How wonderful. What a great description of our King, our Redeemer, the shepherd of the flock, willing to leave the 99 behind to go after that one lost, the one that has gone astray. Are we willing to do the same? Are we willing to look for those that have gone away, lost the prodigal son? We need to be fishers of men, sharing the message, bringing more to the faith, the belief that we share in unity, that Messiah is the only way that leads to the Father. Verse 7, Then Herod, when he had privily called the Magi, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. Because Herod later commanded that all boys, two and younger, be killed in the area, we can assume that the wise men first saw the star a year or so previously on the night that Yahushua was born. Their journey was from the east of Judea. It was not quick, and they may have even left as soon as they had seen it, but it did take time. I don't believe that they showed up the night he was born, like many teach in church, many teach the day of December 25th as the Messiah was born and laid in the manger and the Magi's just happened to show up that same night to give gifts. I think that is a deception and a lie that has been twisted from the doctrine. Verse 8, Then he sent them to Be'at Lachem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. Herod took all possible means to attain accurate information respecting this child, that he might be sure of destroying him. He had become a threat to his throne. The irony is strong here. Herod claimed to uh, claimed desire to worship Yahusha when he really just wanted to kill him. All this might have looked suspicious if he had not clothed it with the appearance of religion. Wicked people often cloak their evil designs under the appearance of religion, of faith. They attempt to deceive those who are really good and to make them suppose that they have the same design, the same purpose, the same want. The plans of wicked people are often well laid. Those plans occupy a long time, well thought out. Such people make diligent inquiry, and all of it has the appearance of faith, of religion, of good works. 
But Yahweh sees through this design and through people that are deceived. I'm sorry. And though people may be deceived to these plans, Yahweh cannot be fooled. Proverbs 15.3 The eyes of Yahweh are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. If you're trying to pull one over on the Creator, you're going to be mistaken. He sees all. He hears all. He knows all. He knows our hearts. Let that be a warning to you. Many in the faith who should be considered lukewarm, but claim that Yahweh knows their heart, knows their intentions, are going to be sorely mistaken because He truly does know your heart. He knows what little effort you are actually putting forth into your walk, into the fruit that you are bearing. We can know a man by its fruit. Is it righteous or is it rotten in wickedness? The wise men, they never promised to return to Herod. They probably guessed that all his eager zeal was actually not so pure as it seemed to be. And their silence did not mean consent. They never agreed to come back and return. And we'll see that they did not. Verse 9. When they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star, which they saw rising in the east, went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Difficult to know what it looked like, but it must have been a luminous appearance, probably akin to that which led the children of Yasharel through the wilderness, which was a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Whether it was seen in the daylight or not is unknown. But that was profound for to read that this star that they were seeing could be connected and correlated to the same cloud by day, fire by night. Hallelujah. That is so wonderful. The words came to rest mean literally came and stood. It can mean only that the star itself moved to guide the Magi. Very interesting. Verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. It must have been a beautiful sight. They knew what this represented, and it brought great joy to them. They were not satisfied, though, with just looking at the star and admiring it. They did something about it. They set out and followed it, just like Moshe did with the burning bush. That is the difference. Those, we all see the light. We all have the scriptures there right in front of us. But are we willing to do something about it? Are we willing to pursue it and follow it with all of our hearts? To me, that's what makes the difference. That's what allows the scales of blindness to be removed. We, were, we are all blind until we see the light, the light of the truth. And when Moshe saw this light, he took action. He went forth and pursued it. He wanted to see what it was about. And that is what the Father wants from us. He wants us to pursue him. That's what makes the difference. That's what's going to separate the wheat from the tares. Yahuwah always provides guidance for all who walk according to the light they have. Whether it be a lot or a little, He can use that light within you for wonderful things. Remember, the light of the Torah, the lamp upon our feet, is but a small, dim light that only shows us enough that we can take the next step. It's not a spotlight that reveals the entire picture, because for one, that would cause a distraction. Maybe we wouldn't have understanding. It would be overwhelming for us. He doesn't want that. He is simple. He doesn't want to cause confusion. 
He provides what we need and can use our light for wonderful things. Yahuwah will guide those who are disposed to find the Savior, even if for a time the light should be withdrawn, yet it will again appear and direct us in the way to the Redeemer. We have all gone astray. We have all followed after man, after the world, putting our light under a bushel. But it is still there. It is still burning within us. And He is able to restore that. Maybe through chastisement. Maybe through testing and trials. That is why He provides those things. Because they are an opportunity for us to dwell and return back to Him. Just like the prodigal son. What a beautiful example and story that is. Because the Father, Yahusha, the Messiah, they are waiting for us to return. If you have gone away, if you have forsaken them, their light is always on. Their door is always open. Their arms are always open, ready to hold you again. Our being led to Yahusha should fill us with joy. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Our Savior, our friend, the all in everything that we need. There is no other way to life, no other way of life. And there is no peace to the soul until He is found. When we are guided to Him, therefore our hearts should overflow with joy and praise, and we should humbly and thankfully follow every direction that leads to the Son of Elohim. Luckily, we know that direction. It is the narrow path. Now, we have all come from a different place, a different road, but it all leads to that one ancient road. And we can find it by the instructions we have, the treasure map, the Torah, the word that became flesh. Verse 11, And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Miriam and his mother, I'm sorry, with Miriam, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. I really wanted to look into these three items because there is so much symbology that we have with these three items here. Notice that Yahusha here is called a young child, not a baby. Likely between maybe 6 to 18 months old. We notice again, against custom, that the child is mentioned before the mother because of who he was, because of the importance. He was a king. We see here three different responses to Yahusha. One may say that all people respond in one of these three ways. We see King Herod displayed an open hatred and hostility towards Yahusha. The chief priests and the scribes were indifferent towards him, all the while retaining their religious respectability. And then we have the wise men who sought out after Yahusha and worshiped him, even at great cost. That's what we need to be. Are we willing to worship him, to seek him out, regardless the cost? We will be persecuted for his name's sake. So prepare yourself, prepare your mind, your body, and your spirit for those things to come. Because if we choose him, if we choose to follow after him and seek him with all our heart, mind, and soul, we will have to endure through those things. These precious gifts were not presented to Mary or Joseph, but to Yahusha himself. Yet the infant did not use them or spend them. They were presented to him for his parents to use on his benefit, on his behalf and his benefit. In the same way, when we give to Yahusha today, 
we do not give to him directly, but to his people who use those gifts on his benefit and on his behalf, hopefully wisely. Like we were mentioning earlier, the fruits of the Spirit, those, when we bear fruit, those are for others to enjoy, to benefit, to learn, and to have. Each of these precious gifts has a symbolic meaning. We know gold is symbolic of the King, our King, the Messiah. Frankincense was used for worship in the temple. It is symbolic of Yahusha, the high priest. And myrrh is a perfume and was used to anoint the dead bodies. It is symbolic of his death for the sake of truth, and therefore of Yahusha, the prophet, and what he would soon have to do. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh were without a doubt the richest of gifts that could be offered to a newborn king, but their significance lies not so much necessarily in the religious symbolism, but also showing the wealth that they represented. Instead of the gifts themselves, they also lend a clue to the identity of the wise men, where they were from. These items were rare and not in abundance in all the lands. So it shows that these wise men had these gifts of their land of great esteem. How useful this gold was to Joseph in the following months. It possibly helped him to offset the cost during the journey into Egypt and back when he had to flee with Messiah and Miriam to protect him from King Herod. But the Heavenly Father knew what these needs would be and met them by anticipation. Many times we can see those own blessings in our lives. We may receive something that we don't understand or we don't know how to use it yet. But the Father is preparing us. He is providing a way for those things to come. We must have great faith in His provisions and use them wisely and let His will be done. Let's not use them up selfishly or in a, in a wrong way quick manner. You know, when we get greedy, when we start thinking in our flesh, things can quickly be spent away. Let's make sure that we are cherishing these gifts and making the best of them. Frankincense. I wanted to really look into frankincense. It's one of my favorite scents smells. We use the essential oil and it is such a wonderful smell, so unique and wonderful, but it is a symbol of holiness and righteousness. The gift of frankincense to the child was symbolic of his willingness to become a sacrifice, wholly giving himself up as in a burnt offering. When we look at myrrh, it symbolizes bitterness, suffering, and affliction. The baby, the child, would grow to suffer greatly as a man and would pay the ultimate price when he gave his life for all who believe in him. In ancient times, frankincense and myrrh were often considered to even be more valuable than gold, with myrrh being the most valuable of the three. We see frankincense holds great significance and symbolic meaning in the scripture, representing worship, prayer, and the connection between human and the divine. In biblical times, frankincense was used in various religious ceremonies as an offering to Yahuwah. Its pleasant aroma and purifying properties made it a fitting symbol of reverence and devotion. Frankincense was also used in anointing rituals where it was applied to individuals or objects to consecrate. This act denoted 
denoted that the setting apart of someone or something as Kodesh and dedicated to Yahuwah. The anointing with frankincense represented the presence of the divine and the bestowing of divine favor. Moreover, the smoke of burning frankincense held the spiritual significance as it was believed to rise to the heavens, carrying prayers and supplications to Yahuwah. It served as a physical representation of the communication between human and the divine realm, a bridge connecting the earthly realm of mortals to the spiritual realm. So by presenting frankincense to Yahusha, the three wise men acknowledged who he was and recognized him as more than just an earthly king. The gift of frankincense symbolized the holiness and divine nature of Yahusha, serving as a testament to his role as the son of Elohim. And finishing up in verse 12, And being warned of El in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. They had probably asked for guidance and understanding because they suspected of Herod's motive and double dealing. But we see that they obtained this understanding, this guidance in a dream. This was done doubtless because if they had given Herod precise information where he was, where Messiah was, it would have been easy for him to send forth and kill him. And from this, we learn that Yahweh will watch over those whom he loves, that he knows how to foil the purposes of the wicked and to deliver his own out of the hands of those who would destroy him. No weapon shall ever be formed against us. The Father will provide. He will protect those that call upon his name, that seek after his kingdom, those that honor and guard his commandments. There are two options in life, two choices and two outcomes. We can receive the promise of the blessing by being obedient, by guarding his commandments, by walking out a righteous, narrow way. Or we can receive the cursing of destruction by following after those false gods, the little g, Elohim, by forsaking the word and going after man and what they lift up and worship. The choice is simple. And ultimately, we know that the only way to the Father is through the Messiah. We were grafted in by belief and by faith. All the branches were removed, were cut off from the olive tree. They were divorced because of their forsaking of the Father. They were led away. All branches were cut off. It doesn't matter what blood runs through your veins, where you were born or where you live. They were all cut off. And only through the belief, the faith, and following of the Messiah, Yahushua HaMashiach, can you be grafted back into that olive tree. The doorway that leads to the Father is through His Son, the Messiah. The only way. No other exception, no other way, but through him. So choose him today. Time is running out. We don't want to be caught off guard. We don't want that day to come as a thief in the night and not be ready, not be prepared, not have our oil ready to go and stored up, our wicks trimmed. We want to be ready, waiting and watching for his return. Because he is the only way to everlasting life, to salvation, to the promised land. Just as the great prophet in the Old Testament led his people to the promised land, so will 
the great prophet of the New Testament, lead his chosen remnant to the promised land. So choose him while we still have a chance, while we still have time. Share this with others. Share the message of the Messiah. It is so important that we get this word out, that we get the teaching of salvation and redemption out to those that are lost and alone in the dark. The world is consuming. The darkness is spreading abroad. We have to shine brighter than ever before so that those lost can be guided back to the Father through the light that He has put within us. So make sure you're burning bright for the Father. Have a fiery faith, trusting in Him that all things are through Him. We must trust His plan and trust that His will is done in our lives. We must ask for that and pray for that. And we will find blessing. We will find longevity. Prolonging our lives, we will find salvation through that promise that He ultimately gave to Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. So thank you so much, everyone. Blessings for your week. May the Father shine brightly on you. May you be able to reflect that light onto others, showing them the love and the forgiveness that we can find through the Son, the last atoning sacrifice, the blood of the Lamb that was given to wipe our sins away so that we could be clean vessels, pure and white as snow. Turn from your ways. Seek the Father in His kingdom. Let His word reveal the understanding and wisdom to you only through the word, only through the instructions can we find that land that we are so journeying on, that we look forward to, the promised land of everlasting life, streets paved of gold. Hallelujah. Love to you all. Blessings to you all. Shalom.